um, and move on to our um, final speaker for this session, who is Alexandra Moylet um, from the University of Bristol. Uh, and she'll be telling us about classically simulating near-term boson sampling. So with that, uh, the floor is yours, Alex. Thank you, Dara. Um, just check, can you see my video there? Or slides? Oh. Can you see that, Dara? Yes. Great. Um, so thank you, Dara, and to the other organizers for invite, giving me the chance to speak here today. I'm just going to briefly note, my neighbors are doing some construction work. So if you hear any loud noises from me, I apologize in advance, uh, from my mic, I apologize in advance for that. So what I am interested in and have been throughout my PhD is the question of a quantum speed up. What I mean by this is I want to find a problem which satisfies three properties. First, it should be solvable by a small noisy quantum computer, the kind of device that we expect to see in the next couple of years. Secondly, it shouldn't be feasibly solvable by a classical computer, whether that's my laptop that I'm presenting on right now or a large scale supercomputer. And thirdly, ideally, we want a problem which is useful as well. It's not just a problem that we're interested in for its hardness properties, but also a problem that has real world applications. So what is boson sampling then? And where does that fit into this picture? Well, in boson sampling, we start off with a linear optical circuit, such as this one here from Anthony Lang's group in Bristol. And it is implementing some random unitary operation. We input into this optical circuit indistinct Inguishable single photons, n of them in total, and we send them into our optical circuit. And the question we're asking in boson sampling is where do these photons come out on the other side? Now, obviously, this is a probabilistic question. They will come out in some random configuration according to a prob probability distribution. But can we sample from that probability distribution? So is boson sampling an example of a quantum speed up then? Well, let's check it's against our three requirements. Is it easy for small noisy quantum computers? Yes, because in effect, boson sampling is a small noisy quantum computer. It isn't a universal one. We can't generate entanglement with it. And it is only solving a very specific problem, the problem of boson sampling, but it is using the laws of quantum physics to solve a map computational problem. Is this problem hard for classical computers? The answer to this is also yes. This is the famous result by Scott Aronson and Alex Arkhipov, where they related the hardness of boson sampling to the hardness of computing matrix permanence. And from that, we're able to show that very strong computational complexity conjectures would be broken if we, we were able to classically simulate the, this problem. And is it useful? This one's a bit more debated. We don't have a definitive application for boson sampling, but there are some potential directions either for boson sampling itself or for variants of it, such as in simulations of, of physical systems. So boson sampling is looking like a strong contender here for this quad on some speed up that I'm trying to find. But this is a speed up in practice in the real world. And this is where things start to get a bit messier because in the real world, we have imperfections in our experiments. So the two imperfections I'm going to be looking at are distinguishability and loss. And if I was giving this talk in person, I would have a nice fun demonstration for, to explain these issues. But we're not in person right now, so I'm going to use the magic of pre-recorded video for this next part. So it, let's assume that our photons are fully indistinguishable at first. 
And so to represent this, I've got three juggling balls. Each juggling ball is a photon. These photons are all red, so they are indistinguishable. And as a result, I can reorder them or permute them in some way, and you cannot see, you cannot tell the difference or figure out how I reordered them. And that adds to the hardness of boson ensembling for a classical simulation. Meanwhile, if our photons are all distinguishable, so as just in this video where they are all different colors, it is much easier to see how they are being reordered and that makes it easier for us to classically simulate. Right. It's also worth noting this distinguishability doesn't necessarily need to be based on wavelength. It could also be other properties of the photons such as their polarization or their uh, um, yeah, or what time they are generated. The other imperfection, like I said, that I'm looking at is photon loss, which also has a nice metaphor in juggling, which is where we start out with more photons than we finish with, such as here. So those are the two imperfections I'm going to be looking at. And more precisely, I'm going to be using a model which I refer to as uniform distinguishability for, and uniform loss. So in uniform distinguishability, each photon has some probability of being either fully indistinguishable from some subset of photons or fully distinguishable from every other photon. So if we think of our two photon experiment from before, we now have this photon has some probability of being red and some probability of being blue. And this photon, some probability of being red and some probability of being green. And so the red photons are a kind of indistinguishable subset and all the remaining photons are fully distinguishable. We have a parameter X, which is the probability of a given photon being in this indistinguishable subset. And likewise, we can define loss in a similar way and have a parameter eta, which is the probability of a photon surviving through from the start to the end of the interferometer. So this model was put forward by Renamer and others a couple of years ago now. And the idea they had for classically simulating this was to compute the probability of, an out, of a given outcome as some polynomial in terms of x or eta. And they'll compute the probability up to some power x to the k, for k that I'll e explain a bit later. And the idea behind this is that the higher order values of x are the ones which are harder to classically compute. So if we just ignore those ones and say that they're part of our error in this case, and we'll just focus on the low order values of x, which are easier to compute. Once we've got the a way of approximating the probability of an outcome, we apply a technique called metropolized independent sampling in order to get a sample. And what Renamer and others were able to show from this is that the error for a ra har random unitary interferometer can be bounded as this quantity here, which crucially is only dependent on our uh, distinguishability or loss x and our level of truncation k. It's not just, what it's not dependent on is how many photons are in our system. And so what they're able to show from this is that you need order n to the 2k computations to sample using this approach, but crucially k is not dependent on n. So we can just choose, as long as our distinguishability x is fixed, we can choose k a to be some constant. And therefore this gives a polynomial runtime for this algorithm. The downside is that this polynomial could be quite large in practice, even if k is quite small, if well, n to the 2k can be quite a big polynomial, say 10 to the 6 or 10 n to the 10, or n to the 10, sorry. Um, and that could mean that we, 
he struggled all well, with performance in that set, performance in practice, even if asymptotically our algorithm is sufficient. The other downside is that, like I said earlier, this error bound is only for a random interferometer. If your interferometer is particularly chosen or has certain structure to it, then there is a good chance that your then your error could actually be significantly worse. And Renema and others gave some examples of such interferometers. So this is what we're going to try and improve on today. And the way we're going to do this is by taking this model and decomposing it into a mixture of different experiments, where what we're changing is what photons are indistinguishable and how, how many of them are. So in our first experiment, not none of our photons are indistinguishable. They're both in this fully distinguishable Subs, none, of the, none of them in this indistinguishable subset, they are both fully distinguishable. In the second one, one of our photons is red, so that's in the indistinguishable subset, and the other one is not, it's still fully distinguishable. And in our third experiment, both of our photons are red, they are both in this fully indistinguishable subset. What we were able to show using techniques that were introduced by myself and Peter Turner, Turner is that the probability of seeing each of these experiments follows the binomial distribution. So effectively, you have n coins, one coin for each photon, and the probability of your coin landing heads is x. And so you just flip each coin in turn, and the number of heads you have is the number of indistinguishable photons in your experiment. And so we were able to take this and use techniques related to the trace. So how do we simulate this then? Um, the first thing we do is we choose, we sample how many pho photons are indistinguishable. And in order to avoid the very hardest cases where we're simulating full boson sampling with every person being indistinguishable, we choose to truncate at some level k, which I will choose at later. At. So in this case, we're going to say, we're only going to sample the first, either no photons being in this indistinguishable subset or one photon being in the indistinguishable subset. We're not going to simulate the case where both photons are. Once we've chosen our subset of indistinguishable photons, we simulate those using an established algorithm by Peter and Raphael Clifford. And after we've simulated and sampled from our indistinguishable photons, all we have left are the fully distinguishable photons, each of which can be sampled by simulating by running it through the inter simulating it going through the interferometer individually. And what we were able to show using the trace distance is that the worst case error for any interferometer sampling from this approach can be bounded to at most a constant if we choose our value k to be, our truncation level k to be proportional to n and at least great up to some alpha greater than x. So that this means that we're sampling most of the cases that we're sampling the most likely cases that we are going to see in our experiments and that's are easy to compute. So the nice properties of this algorithm now are that we do have a worst case error bound and rather than this average case error bound from before. We also now have a more efficient algorithm in terms of k because of the use of Clifford and Clifford and because of how we're, pro of how we're sampling and approximating these probabilities. The downside is that now k is dependent on the number of photons in our experiment. And so that means that if we substitute k is equal to alpha n into this expression, we end up with an exponential runtime asymptotically in terms of the total number of photons in our experiment. So 
asymptotically, we seem to be doing worse here. But does that really matter? Because sure, asymptotics are great to look at, but at the end of the day, both on sampling experiments are only interested in going up to maybe 50 to 100 photons. We're not really interested in scaling in up to arbitrarily large numbers. So can we perform better in that regime? And we did various bits of analysis on that. And the brief answer to that is yes. So I'm not going to go into the full analysis of what we did, but here's one example of some results where our horizontal axis is the number of photons in our experiment. Our vertical axis is approximately how many runtimes each classical simulation needs to obtain a sample. The dashed lines are the previous algorithm, this approximating the probability of an outcome approach. The solid lines are our new approach. And we have chosen different values of distinguishability and loss for the red and green lines. So the red lines represent a kind of idealized boson sampling experiment where with the best sources, best interferometers, and best detectors available. And the green lines represent a really poor experiment where half of your photons are lost and half of them are distinguishable. And what we found is that even in the bad case, our runtime for the, the new approach is better for over two, up to 200 plus photons. And in the kind of more idealized case, our algorithm is better for nearly 400 photons. And this is pretty significant for two reasons. First of all, the number of operations that can be performed by a supercomputer in an hour is only about 10 to the 20, which is this line here. And so that already quite heavily limits the number of photons that we would be interested in simulating. And secondly, 50 photons is the kind of limit of what is classically simulable in full boson, in idealized boson sampling. So that is kind of the scale that we are looking at experimentally. So within that range, our algorithm is gains a significant advantage for classical simulators. So I'm just going to quickly go over what's next. There's a big caveat here, which is what's next for me is I start my next job on Monday. So I'm not really going to be doing much much new further work on this, but there are some interesting directions. First is can we consider other noise models that, such as dark counts or spectral purity? Can we also consider other forms of linear optics such as adaptive circuits or Gaussian boson sampling? And can we improve these classical simulation algorithms even further? So just to wrap up then, Distinguishability and loss do need to be considered when building boson sampling experiments because people building classical simulators for them will be taking advantage of those and other imperfections. We, it's great to focus on asymptotic runtimes, but we also need to think about how those runtimes apply in practice this as well in the near term. And finally, experimentalists still have quite a way to go if they want to beat classical simulators. So that's everything I wanted to present. I would just like to briefly thank my collaborators, Raul Garcia Patron, who is now at the University of Edinburgh, Yelma Renema at the University of Twente, and my supervisor here in Bristol, Peter Turner, as well as all of these great people down here for their, their views and offering me desk space and support and everything. And if you're interested in the paper, you can find the reference here. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Alex, for that lovely talk. Um, we've uh, finished a little bit ahead of time, which is good. So there's um, uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, I've got one or two, but perhaps I'll, I'll go to one from the audience um, mm -hmm. that came in. Um, so this is from Will Dixon. And uh, I, I think he's referring here to um, something you said right at the start of your talk. So he's asked, how long is the next couple of years in your estimation? <laughs> Um, I would like to say three years, personally. Um, 
So, so, so I, in, 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 in three years, there'll be uh, a sort of um, a quantum advantage shown in a sort of boson sampling kind of setup. That's what I, that's what I would hope for. Um, certainly, if it's not, but like, hopefully we've moved up on from demonstrating quantum advantage by that, that point. Point I would like, like to hope. Um, like obviously Google have already already of the opinion that we have achieved it and it's time to move on now. But yeah. I'm interested, but I would like to see these other kind of quantum advantage proposals, see if any of them also prove successful in that time as well. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and one here from Jake Olmer. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think other areas of classical simulation of quantum systems could benefit from your techniques? Um, I certainly think there are other uh, linear optical systems which could benefit from the, these classical simulation techniques. So um, personally, I want to say interested in Peter Turner and I have been looking at trying to apply these methods to Gaussian boson sampling. We've also, I would also be interested in kind of more universal linear optics tests as well, such as either adaptive circuits or circuits or me measurement based stroke post selected linear optics. Okay. Um, and um... I had a question about, um, I think it was on slide 14, you, you, you showed this plot comparing your um, yep. algorithm versus the other. So am I to understand, so the green lines there are a kind of, um, uh, this is where the distinguishability and loss are fairly high. That's where it is, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then the red line is where things are more um, favorable, let's say. Yeah. So I guess, it, I mean, just looking at these two sets of graphs, it looks like your algorithm, um, how, do I, how, is, how do I want to say this? It looks like the point at which your algorithm ceases to be better than the other one um, kind of uh, increases as the parameters become more ideal. So yeah. Does that trend kind of continue? So if I were to take um, a kind of a, a value of loss even lower and a value of distinguishability even lower, then I would have to go to a much higher n um, before your algorithm uh, isn't, the, isn't the best one. Is that right? That, that's what we suspect. We haven't, yeah, that's what we suspect. Um, and do we know um, sort of in, in, in typical experiments, have we got an idea like of, of, of what these numbers are? So are, 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 are you know, are the, are the boson sampling experiments that are being done kind of more like the green lines or more like the red lines? Do, do we know Definitely that? more towards the red lines. So distinguishability is quite high in boson sampling experiments. experiments. Loss it a bit harder to quantify since um, in ideal boson sampling experiments, that what loss is kind of not mentioned, and it's just right mentioned um, since you kind of just post select loss away. Mm -hmm. There have been some experiments where they have considered boson loss as well. So the most recent one was this the paper that came out at the end of last year, I think, from Janway Pan's group. Yeah, group where they looked at classic where they looked at but did, implemented boson sampling where I think the loss was, they were generating 20 photons and post-selected in on um, 14 photons being lost, I think. So that would be E to equal to about 0.7. Okay, right. And so X was like pretty high. high. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they were using dot sources, right? So for them, X could be, yeah, certainly around 0.9 was all higher. I yeah. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then, um, well, I suppose uh, uh, there's a question here, which I, I guess is related to this plot, which is what is the mm -hmm. parameter of K for these? So your truncation parameter. Um, so we, for these algorithms we were choosing, so K was one of the things we were adjusting. 
with our runtime. Um, so what we were doing is for these given values of eta and x, we were choosing a value of k sufficiently high to simulate it up to some epsilon error. I think it was 0 0.1. Okay, so it's determined by the accuracy of the... Yeah, accuracy of the simulation. And so it kind of feeds into the runtime here. Um, okay, and um, another question here, I guess, I think this is also related to this plot. So the, the, mm -hmm. the question is, um, in the runtime versus number of photons plots, and that's this one, there are quite big jumps for the dashed lines at n equals 100 and n equals 200. Yeah. So those, yeah, is so there, that is the point where your truncation, your value of k goes up. So it's kind of going up as, as a step. So it kind of goes up by one and then plateaus for this and then goes up by one again. Since your algorithm's runtime is growing exponentially with k, but k is not depe only dependent. So yeah, it's just where this algorithm is kind of stepping up in its runtime, in okay. its level of truncation. I see. And um, yeah, we'll have one more question then. So um, the question is, could, could your model deal with time dependent indistinguishability? And then in brackets, as in the boson sampling with quantum dots case. Sorry, time dependent indistinguishability? So I'm, I guess what the, uh, what, what is being asked here is, um, I like suppose we, typically a photon from a dot uh, has a kind of a somewhat complicated spectrum. So mm. distinguishability between two different photons uh, perhaps might, be a, might not be able to be captured by just a kind of one number, which is the overlap. Um, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I wonder if, I, I think that might be the question. Yeah, have you got any thoughts about that? So we haven't considered that in this in this work like we kind of chose a one for a one parameter model as that was kind of, that's kind of the simplest model you can think of certainly the techniques that peter turner and i introduced in our previous paper are general are very ge are general and so uh, the idea would be that um you could it kind of incorporates different uh, models of distinguishability into it. So we could incorporate it into that. We would be able to model that at, and then see whether or not this classical simulation approach would work, but I don't know right now. Right, okay. Cool, okay, with that, um, I will thank you again. Um, thanks thank again, you. Alex. I'm